Welcome to the Red Sneaker Podcast, your guide to success in the worlds of writing and publishing. Now, here's your host, best-selling author and founder of the Red Sneaker Writers Center, William Bernhardt. Hello, you Red Sneaker Writers. This is episode 37 going out on January 27, 2020. This podcast is for Red Sneaker Writers people who are serious about having a writing career and want some practical knowledge to help them do it. And speaking of practical knowledge, the most recent book in the Red Sneaker Writing series, What Writers Need to Know, is now on sale. In the last podcast, it was available for pre-order, but now it's out there for reels. You can get the ebook or print edition right now, and the audiobook will be out soon. This book covers a wide variety of topics, some relating to writing, like creating a series character or viewpoint, and some marketing topics, like how to write a great book description, and also covers some legal issues of importance to writers, too. So please check that out. On this episode, my interview is with Randy Varnell, who is a video game developer and writer for Gearbox, one of the most prominent and successful video game companies out there. Maybe you don't normally associate video games with writing, with storytelling, but as Randy is about to explain, you really should. But first, the news. It's still early days in 2020, so it's probably no big surprise that people are still wrapping up what we've learned from the previous year, and for that matter, the previous decade. Thanks to BookScan, we now have some official numbers on how traditional publishers, print publishing, did in 2019. And overall, the outlook is a little bit gloomy. For 2019, U.S. print sales overall dropped. Not huge, but they did drop about 1.5% as compared to the previous years. Both adult fiction and nonfiction also dropped during the previous year. Nonfiction by about 1% and fiction by about 3%. Could be worse, could be a lot better, but that's a lot of books. Even young adult, which in previous years has soared, but Young adult fiction also saw some declines. Nonfiction, both for middle readers and young adult, did okay. But young adult fiction saw some drops, in this case, more than 8%. Overall, what can you, the red sneaker writer, take away from this? Well, we've got continuing double-digit declines in print sales, including in some very popular genres like science fiction. And romance, which typically is the best-selling genre and still is, but the numbers are declining. Why? I suspect the biggest reason is the decline of mass market paperbacks. As you probably remember, once upon a time, you saw paperbacks everywhere you went, grocery store, drug drugstore, whatever, and now much less so. A lot of the people who used to buy those kinds of less expensive paperbacks have now gravitated toward ebooks or perhaps other forms as well. Some people are speculating that uh, the decline in mass market paperbacks is because more people are going to the library. I hope that's true. I haven't seen any real evidence of it. Some of that sector may be migrating to subscription services like Scribd or Kindle Unlimited. I think there's been a little bit of that. Uh, And a lot of that market share, let's face it, is shifting to self-published authors who are selling their work primarily through ebooks and also to audiobooks, which, of course, continue to increase. Given the state of the market right now, probably it should come as no surprise to you what Mike Shatskin is saying in his most recent blog post. I've mentioned Mike's blog before. It's a terrific place to get business and market analysis because nobody does it better than him and what he talks about in the most recent blog post is basically twofold first that the number of available titles has skyrocketed 
but that's led to declining sales for the large publishers, particularly the big five, but also some significant publishers who aren't in the big five who are seeing decreasing sales overall and especially for new titles. Why would that be? Well, remember that once upon a time, traditional publishing would issue new titles and they'd be out for a little while and then they'd be off the shelves for a little while and then most would go out of print. Today, of course, with ebooks and print on demand, almost nothing goes out of print, which has made everybody's backlist swell to near infinite proportions. According to Shatskin, there are now over 15 million books in print. And, of course, many, if not most of those, are available at Amazon. So you see how the market has changed. Every time you or anyone else bring out a new title, you're instantly competing against 15 million other books that are still in print. Well, that's a big change from the way things used to be. And as a result, according to Mike, this, uh, commercial publishers are not publishing. Here we're talking about traditional publishers. Print publishers are not publishing nearly as many new titles as they used to. Why? Because it's a big risk. According to Mike, it is not uncommon, which means it is common if you eliminate the double negative, for new titles from a major publisher's list to sell less than a 1,000 copies. Three-digit sales are commonplace. Now think about that for a minute. If you self-published a book and it sold fewer than a thousand copies, you'd probably think of it as a failure. I have friends who have self-published books that sold more than a thousand copies and they're getting a larger royalty rate, but they still think of the book as a failure. Well, to me, this puts a lot in perspective. If the big five are basically losing money on most of their new titles, That would explain why they're being much more conservative and publishing fewer new titles, trying to make money other ways by creating online bookstores or by acquiring the backlist of another publisher, things like that. Realistically, I think we have to expect that in years to come, big publishers are going to shrink. The number of new titles they bring is also going to shrink and the market is going to shift in favor of smaller publishers and self-publishers. I think that's almost inevitable, given what's going on right now. Okay, new topic. Oprah is back in the book club game, and she has picked a new title, and big surprise, it's almost overnight become controversial. This book is American Dirt, which is written by a woman named Janine Cummins, It's basically the story of Mexican immigrants who cross over into the U.S. border. And it obviously is sympathetic as it dramatizes their plight. People in uh, advance reviews called it the grapes of wrath for this generation. So why would that be controversial? Well, in part, because the author identifies as white. And I put it that way because she herself has some not only Irish, but Puerto Rican ancestry. She spent a lot of time in Mexico, but identifies as white. So that's problem number one. Also, people have criticized it as cultural appropriation and, uh, you know, white savior stories and have even accused it of being stereotypical. One reviewer, Miriam Gerba, called it, uh, said that the author reinforces, quote, Overly ripe Mexican stereotypes, among them the Latin lover, the suffering mother, and the stoic man-child, end quote. Another uh, writer and reviewer, David Bowles, called it, quote, smug saviorism, end quote. Oprah sticks by her pick. She says what Cummins has done is humanized an important issue. Well, This is a continuing theme, isn't it? We've seen this before on the podcast. It seems to be happening over and over again in the publishing world as we become increasingly sensitive on matters of race and gender. I'll get to that in just a minute. (laughs) But in race, I mean, the author Cummins saw this coming up front in the foreword to the book. She says, quote, 
I wished someone slightly browner than me would write it. But then she continues to say that maybe she could serve as a bridge. Quote, I thought if you're the person who has the capacity to be a bridge, why not be a bridge? End quote. I have to point out that most of the reviews of the book, the book itself, are good. I have not read it, but it seems to be a pretty engrossing story. But because it involves people of different cultures and races, it's become a political uh, online firestorm. I will say again what I said in the last podcast. Be sensitive to these issues. It's worth the time and trouble of getting a sensitivity read. Send the manuscript out to someone who can comment with authority on these kinds of issues and see if you can eliminate problems before they happen. I would hate to think we've entered a world where nobody can write about important issues because somebody's going to gripe about it. Imagine if Harriet Beecher Stowe, a white woman, had felt that it would be cultural appropriation if she wrote about the plight of slaves. We wouldn't have gotten Uncle Tom's Cabin, and American history would have dramatically been altered and not for the better. There has to be some middle ground here where writers can write what they feel called to write, but with sensitivity, without offending people in the process. A somewhat similar story is coming out of the science fiction world due to a a short story published in a science fiction magazine. The, The story is called, I Sexually Identify as an Attack Helicopter which, of course, is playing off a familiar meme, which is sort of paradizing the current business about transgender and sexual identity and whatnot. Some people read the story and thought it was wonderful. Some people thought it lacked sensitivity to transgender people, called it transphobic or insulting to the LGBTQ community or whatnot. Uh, The bottom line here is that the periodical removed the story from their publication rather than face up to the onslaught. Irony here is that at the same time this is going on, Harlequin, the leading romance publisher we've got, has just started a new LGBTQ romance imprint. In other words, they're going to do a line of romance tales, contemporary ones, with an LGBTQ focus. Those are going to come out in ebook and mass market focus. And if that would interest you, go to their website and read all about it. They're looking for books of a length of roughly 55,000 to 65,000 words. Let me give you a couple of updates on other stories we've covered. Last time I talked about the brouhaha at the Romance Writers of America, which also stems from claims of an author being insensitive on issues of race. This magnified to such a proportion that the major publishers like Harlequin, Avon, Entangled, Berkeley, and others pulled out of the conference. And then RWA announced they weren't going to give awards this year. They would give awards for the year, but next year, presumably, do two years at once. And then both the president and the executive director of the organization resigned. Uh, It's just become a huge mess. I'm sure RWA will bounce back from it, but it does again demonstrate how this business of dealing with race and gender and other important issues is impacting the book publishing industry. And again, I hope to you, Red Sneaker Writers, is emphasizing the need for sensitivity. One more update. I talked several podcasts ago about the dispute uh, with Audible and some book publishers when Audible announced that they were going to add a captions feature to their audiobooks. That is, while the audiobook is playing, text would scroll along the bottom of the screen in sync with the audio. There might even be some other interactive features. Well, I can see the advantage of that. Many times I'm usually listening to audiobooks in the car and I think I missed something and roll it back and still can't tell. Uh, Same thing happens sometimes when I watch television. Maybe it's just age. But (laughs) a caption that you could read and clarify what you just heard would really be advantageous. The problem, of course, is that 
the ability or the right to do this was not written in Audible.